All right, so uh, my name is Ted Pavlik. So I'm from ASU. My background's kind of in a mixture of electrical engineering, economics, and organismal biology. Uh, so um, I'm not going to talk um, so much about kind of the econ side of things, but um, but after seeing the earlier talk, I really kind of got thinking about that. But I'm going to talk more about kind of the ecology and what um, ecology has done brought to me as I look at engineering designs in my own laboratory and just looking at designs in general. And, um, and so really the title that I originally had was a bit of a mouthful and um, kind of a placeholder. So really the shorter title or a better title for this talk and the title I'm kind of going through here is thinking outside the box what ecology and organism biology can offer to engineering design. And so, um, so my own background is kind of mixed in my personal life. I actually do have um, you know, an autonomous vehicle. So this is in uh, my garage. This is our Tesla Model 3. We do take it, you know, fully autonomous. It changes lanes, it goes off interchanges and all that. And, and in operating um, such a vehicle, um, you start realizing that there are a lot of other aspects about uh, the experience that have nothing to do with the things that make it to the headlines. So um, the way the steering works in the vehicle is very different than the way the steering works in our more conventional vehicle um, next to it in the garage. Um, the way the pedals work in this vehicle is very different than that. And it changes the way I interact with the vehicle, the way I interact with the road. Um, it just in general creates a new different sort of ecosystem. And um, that is the, um, the kind of thing I'm going to talk about today is this kind of the effect of the, um, the ecosystem on these designs and where function really lives. Does it live in the vehicle or does it live in the vehicle's interaction with the surroundings? And, um, and I'm kind of an autonomy geek. So, you know, you can see a reflection off the Tesla of our smart garage door. Uh, the entire house is automated. Um, you know, we haven't, I think, touched a switch in our house in, I don't know, in 10 years. So, um, so that's, it's, you know, immersing myself in autonomy has been largely an exercise and sort of better understanding um, the risks and benefits of these sorts of things. So that's at least my, my personal experience with this. Um, more professionally, um, I have done some work uh, with autonomous vehicles. So this is a patent that um, was finally came out, um, I think in 2020 is when finally the date that got stamped on it, um, on a cruise control system that takes into account both the vehicle you're following as well as the vehicle that is behind you. And this is something that I wish was implemented in my Tesla, because if somebody uh, starts tailgating you when you're driving the car, you um, know that it's safe to do particular things to put some space in between not only the vehicle in front of you, but the vehicle behind you. And, um, and that sort of thing, you know, the idea that there is a space behind the vehicle is something that doesn't seem to be well appreciated by current designs, because everybody's very much thinking, um, you know, it's funny, we think about our eyes facing forward as if the only thing that matters is in front of us. And I think we write code as if the only thing that matters is in front of us. When clearly when we're driving, we have those mirrors, we're looking backwards and we are actually making use of that rear view mirror continuously, but our algorithms aren't. And so um, we wrote a little paper up here that, um, that actually showed that we could have much safer outcomes in realistic driving simulators with autonomous cruise control systems that took into account um, both the vehicle behind you and in front of you. Um, and it's something that, you know, we hope to start, you know, seeing in the future. So that's at least my, um, you know, ex a little bit of my experience with AVs. I'll bring that back around uh, here at the end. Um, but uh, I also have a lot of experience with other systems. And so, for example, this is a postdoc of mine who's a tropical ecologist. And this is an experiment that she ran that is being published in Myrmecological News um, uh, right now. And uh, these are uh, two different species of army ants. And so there's, um, it, I'll have some stills in a second here, but uh, you can see this kind of trail of one species down the edge here. And this other group that has been dislodged, has been put in place here. If you start noticing there's some interesting action happening right here. Um, to give you a little bit of background, these two species of army ants um, do not uh, compete over anything. They do not normally um, interact uh, very often. There is no value in escalating to an aggressive interaction. However, they both need to make efficient use of this common resource because they're terrestrial. And so what they uh, end up doing is what we've found that they've, they're doing is that they, and maybe in a still, it'll be easier to see this, um, uh, they form these living walls, as you can see up here. So you get one species will just stop and stand in place, facing off against the other species that will also stop and stand in place. And depending on which two species you combine, you'll either get both 
uh, species will end up forming these living walls that sort of act as these kind of crossing guards, um, or you get just one acting as these living walls, or in some species, they actually do escalate to aggression, or they completely ignore each other. Um, now, um, the function of these walls when they do form is that the ones that are static and get stuck here, um, they end up causing all of their conspecifics to, as they bump into the back of them, they get rerouted, they get moved over. And the ones that are on this side do the same with their conspecifics, they get moved over. And so it's a little bit like uh, platelets uh, forming a clot and it ends up actually redirecting the flow of traffic until they're far enough away from each other that these um, scabs naturally flake off and, when they're unneeded and then they go away forever. So they are a transient structure that reroutes traffic until it's away from each other. And so um, this um, is an example of uh, a system that we use where we look at these natural systems to treat them as model systems to give us ideas for things like traffic organization. Now I'm not suggesting that um, you know the autonomous vehicles uh, driving down the 10 uh, are, uh, should be doing something like this. That's not kind of what I'm trying to say here, but it's this idea that you can get these self-organized transient structures that do not come from necessarily sort of a, a sophisticated infrastructure system or sophisticated communication between the agents, but they just sort of naturally emerge. And so it's one way we can think about how um, transient structures are formed in traffic. And sometimes those transient structures may actually be adaptive as opposed to just these kind of gunky congestion things that form on a highway. Um, we can also think about this, um, say, in military applications in terms of deconfliction. And so uh, we, you know, in, in a bunch of military applications, you can have um, a number of drones that um, happen to be flying nearby a number of other drones from a, say, a peer group where you're not necessarily enemies, but you do have territories. And so there is a lot of work in if you accidentally come close to um, another peer group that is, again, not necessarily an enemy me, but not someone that, uh, but a group that you need to sort of maintain boundaries with, how do you deconflict? How do you naturally get out of that space? And this provides us kind of an interesting way to think. If you did have a totally disorganized space and you had a swarm of, uh, you know, of air vehicles and another swarm of air vehicles, how might you have them sort of naturally keep themselves um, apart? Um, or we can view these as kind of model systems for complex adaptive systems uh, in general, where here we've got kind of this uh, self-organized subroutine where this temporary living walling behavior um, naturally gets fired off without any central control. And when it is not needed, it kind of goes away naturally. And we really like this particular system because unlike um, other systems that you might've seen that are maybe more charismatic in National Geographic where you've got bridges that are being built and all that, is there's a lot of individuals in those kind of more charismatic examples. And it's hard to keep track of what every individual is doing. But in this system, you know, we only have maybe 15 or so individuals individuals forming a wall on one side and a similar number on the other side. We can track each one of them. We can keep track of which we, what each one of are doing. And then we can sort of figure out what cues they're using to, uh, to, to actually then flip from one behavior to another and then use that in our say stochastic robotics designs. And so um, that's kind of you know something we could do without. But what I really want, I'm using this today is to motivate um, not thinking about ants necessarily, but thinking about ecology in general as a, um, as a model system for thinking about autonomy. Um, so how would ecologists think about autonomous systems and the questions related to autonomy? And so, um, so kind of uh, to give an example of what I mean by that. So here's some work that uh, was done by a uh, former graduate student of mine who's just started a postdoc in the UK. And uh, if you can imagine a bunch of these little robots, these are happen to be grit spots, which are a, a platform that comes out of Georgia Tech. This is an earlier version, version of them. And uh, if, you, if you think about the group of these robots together, if they want to achieve certain types of formation, then the kind of standard way um, we 
think about them achieving this formation might involve seeing things like localization and a lot of communication. The robot back here um, might need to know where the robot up here is. And, you know, and the, I think the traditional way that people think about achieving this kind of localization here often involves sending a lot of messages, explicit message passing back and forth, because you've got radios on these things. So why not use these radios? But what we were interested is in kind of small groups like the ones down here, we realized that they have such regular behaviors that perhaps there were important cues that were being missed. And if we just went directly to radio, then we might lose um, how much uh, information was already available to us just by watching a nearby robot. In other words, if I imagine a scenario, say in these, just these three here, um, if this robot back here needs to know the position of this robot up here and doesn't have any ability to communicate with any of these robots, but can watch the robot in between it, how much information can this robot back here get about this robot up here just by watching this robot right here? And if we have a module that allows us to do this for three robot pairs, then can we apply this recursively so that if you can infer the position of this robot up here, could you then use the inferred position of this robot with the observed position of this robot to predict the position of the robot ahead of it, and so on and so forth. And so um, we said, well, you know, we would... There's a number of different ways we could try to do this. I have a control theory background, and so I could build an observer and model all this. But uh, my student is much more on the kind of the computer science side of things. He said, "Well, let's try things a little more model-free. Let's just throw some a simple uh, deep neural network at this and see if it can learn these relationships on its own." And so that's what he ended up doing. Um, and this is kind of borrowing from the ideas that come again from ecology. Um, and this here on the right here is Nico Timbergen, a Nobel Prize winner, uh, who is one of the kind of thought of as, as the, the kind of founders of behavioral ecology. Um, but one of the things that Timbergen was known for was the evolution of signaling. And so Timbergen provided a formal framework to think about how informative cues become ritualized into signals. And so the idea is if I stub my toe, um, I might just happen to make a physiological response. Like I just happen to say, oh, because I stub my toe. Now, eventually someone else might pick up that whenever they hear that, oh, that only happens when I'm in pain. And I might learn that if I make that noise, someone else might come to my aid. And so over evolutionary time, eventually we might learn to use that signal having it being divorced from the physiological thing that was associated with. I can start making that noise, ugh, ow, without actually having to stub my toe and it will get someone's attention. And so that is the evolution of a signal, which is kind of a ritualized cue um, and, and so sort of the evolution of what we might view in the kind of robotic case is wireless communication. But the thought here is that in, in evolutionary biology, before every signal was a cue, there was already an extremely informative cue. And so the idea here was that could we use machine learning to extract these cues so that we don't have to resort to these signals. And this is something that psychologists are well aware of. And so this is sort of an example um, uh, about a uh, gate from uh, out of a, a 2012 article in Cognition, where it turns out that just watching someone's gait as they walk around gives you a huge amount of reliable information about uh, certain trait judgments in those people. Just walking, watching how they walk tells you a lot. Uh, a reliable and consistent information about how they do wide ranges of other things. And so our thought was that if our if we can build a brain that is fairly advanced, maybe we do not need as much communication. Maybe we can get a lot from just what that brain can observe. And so that's what we're kind of you know, capitalizing on here is we said, well, if we assume motion rules are relatively simple in all of these robots, but each robot has relatively high computational power, which that is an assumption we can make in modern times, then in that case, uh, maybe we can actually make a huge number of inferences on this large group while only observing a small number of robots in that group. And that's what he started out in this paper from 2017, uh, where he was able to just use a simple machine learning algorithm um, on groups of three robots to generate this inference engine 
on this back robot here and then put them in long strings. And in those long strings, this robot, and I can pause it here, this robot in the back here is gonna be able to detect this, that this robot in the front has started to make a motion, it started to move. And when it, it its detection of the motion of this robot in the front allows it to implement a complementary behavior where the goal here is imagine that this robot has just encountered something that it needs to encircle. So it's much more efficient for this robot to start encircling on it and close in like a clamshell than to be pulled along into this circle here. And so that's what ends up happening here is that this robot ends up being able to detect that this robot has started to make a movement just by watching the slight variations in how this robot is moving. To the eye in this simulation, I couldn't even tell that this robot made any differences in its movement, but this robot could see that and actually could infer the position of all other robots in this chain and execute this complementary action. So that was kind of how we, we started um, using this. We sort of was just a proof of concept. And we've done a lot of other work um, since then, um, you know, having to do with how many robots do you have to observe? Um, how complicated does the neural network need to be? Is there um, additional things we can add to the neural network to make the inference better? And in parallel with that, you know, and you know, apparently, you know, seemingly independently than that, we've started to see like this just came out a couple of weeks ago. Um, someone has used a basic um, observer approach on a robotic fish there where a follower fish uses pressure variations that it can see directly in front of it in the water to make inferences about the pose of the fish in front of it, which we view as just a simple version of what we're doing here. But they had to build a model and then use uh, levenberg markhardt algor algorithm to actually then converge on an estimate for that fish up in front. And getting back to autonomous vehicles, a year after we published that paper, um, again, apparently independently than that, um, from Shankar Sastry's lab, um, then they, um, you know, started to, you know, get kind of a similar insight that we did, that if you're observing a vehicle like this one here, so if you're looking out your driver's window observing this vehicle, there might be a pedestrian on the other side of that vehicle. And if you're trying to decide if you want to pass this vehicle, it would sure be nice to know if there's a pedestrian that's going to come out in front of this car so you know whether you should accelerate or not. And so what they did is they built a little inference engine that's able to use behavioral variations in this vehicle to better predict where a pedestrian uh, might be. And so in the standard approach, there's kind of a just a, a general um, flat probability that a pedestrian is out here in front of that car. But in their approach, they're able to get um, much more refined predictions of where the pedestrian might be, be able to use that in the in, in information here. So that's just by observing one vehicle, you're able to predict the position of another vehicle. And this is something that um, we have been implementing in these robotic cases. Um, so this is a, a 2020 paper of ours, where again, we are able to do that for far, far more many vehicles. And so the, um, the, the triangles here are the captured positions from an overhead camera of the these individual robots in these different cases. And so this is um, estimating one second ahead, two seconds ahead, three seconds ahead, four seconds ahead. And the circles that you can kind of, that might be difficult to see on these vehicles here, these are the, es these are the positions that this yellow vehicle in the back are estimating for these three vehicles, just using observations of this vehicle back here. So again, you can end up finding that you get a huge amount of information about a giant group just by observing the local observations of this individual vehicle here. So what Timbergen would tell us is that if it would be very costly to evolve wireless communication, then in this particular case, you probably don't need it. So all these vehicles will eventually have DSRC radio and we have to figure out how to make DSRC work and all these sorts of things. And that's great. And maybe DSRC is something that we're definitely gonna have and gonna make use of, but we may not need it for everything because you can actually get a huge amount of situational awareness about things far off without actually having to radio information around. And so um, with this in Motivated, I've been working with other ecologists. So like Tanya Lati, with, uh, who works with um, honeybees, uh, different types of honeybees and stingless bees in Australia, as well as Mike Angeletta and Robbie Wilson, um, who um, work with things like deception and crayfish, then we can start asking more interesting ecological questions like, all right, that's great. So you're telling me that regularities give me information far outside of my sensing range. 
how much can I trust that? So now we can imagine behavioral hacking where you can hack the behavior of one vehicle to create an image of things that aren't actually there. So at what point um, do we kind of um, dither between our private information and our social information? And it turns out there's a lot of excellent uh, examples in ecological cases where we actually see how animals are trading between those two. And we're thinking about ways in which we can implement those um, in these autonomous cases. Um, and then the other sort of interesting thing that we're doing there is um, we're actually using humans as model systems for this as well. We take semi-professional soccer players and we know that uh, they um, practice deception, but there's only a limited amount of deception that they can do when they're say, um, trying to kick on goal. And so we try to understand um, if you are the one doing the deception, uh, what are the limits of how much you can deceive given the fact that you actually have to stay on the road or given the fact that you actually have to play the game. And so we can shift um, from thinking about autonomous vehicles to thinking about deception in a semi-pro soccer game. So again, trying to use, you know, so, it, you know, I, I teach a lot of modeling classes and we go from analytical modeling to computational modeling. And then for me as an organismal biologist, then we also look for organismal models. And I view humans as an organismal model to study deception the same way I view ants as an organismal model to study self-organized traffic flow management. So those are kind of examples of how I'm trying to bring ecology into the engineering design process. And I just want to generalize that um, to kind of the sort of a, a kind of taking a bigger picture view of that. And this is something that motivates the way I look at all technology and all design, not only the designs in my lab, but the designs around me as well, is, is sort of how would an ecologist, uh, how would an alien ecologist, an ethologist lands on earth from some other planet and starts looking at the way humans interact with their technology, how would they analyze those things? So what is the behavioral ecology of um, socio-technical systems? And, um, and the perspective I take again is from kind of Tim Bergen. Again, Tim Bergen was a, um, one of the kind of founders of behavioral ecology with Conrad Lorenz and Carl von Frisch. And, um, and Tim Bergen's, along with the Q ritualization, um, then Tim Bergen's main approach was in is sort of better formalizing how biologists think of the evolution of behavior. So the way I think most people are taught about natural selection and say, you know, I know secondary school is that uh, there is some mechanism, something that is, you know, the, something that is built um, out of, uh, you know, soft matter. So something that is built out of tissue and it performs some function. And that function um, is what we refer to as an adaptation. And that adaptation, the value of that, that you know, that function uh, has shaped the mechanism. So this is usually the kind of what we think of as like, sort of like the, the use uh, over here and then how the thing is actually built. So making things a little more concrete, it's really useful to be able to see things. So I have eyeballs. Eyeballs allow me to see things. I, from a mechanistic side, can study how the eyeball works. But um, on a more ultimate causation side of things, um, I can then say, well, why is it good to have eyeballs? But if you only consider these two boxes, then it leaves out a lot of really important questions like, why do I have eyeballs and not CCD cameras? So um, I got interviewed um, from uh, uh, the Washington Post, because I happen to be a engineer who owns a Tesla. And, um, and he kept trying to get me to say that Tesla's needed LIDAR. He used to, you know, LIDAR is so much better. Don't they need LIDAR, 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 LIDAR? And so then, you know, but then that, that brings up this nice question. Why LIDAR and not cameras? Why cameras and not eyeballs? Why aren't there eyeballs on a Tesla? Why aren't there CCD cameras inside my head? And so that brings up that, you know, what Tim Bergen kind of pointed out, is that natural selection is really a pipeline that gets filtered through a lot of constraints. And those constraints kind of have these boxes over here on the proximate side, the how side, where it's not just how does the thing work, but it's also how was the thing built ontogeny, the developmental side? You actually had to grow this thing from a single cell somewhere. And then on the Y side, um, you can't just think about the adaptation. You have to think about the historical baggage. So this thing had to evolve from some other things. And there might have been some things that you just got stuck with. 
So there are these kind of legacy components that were here. And in the end, as much as we tell a design story where we say that eyes were built to see, really, the adaptation is an emergence from the interaction between the mechanism and the current environment. So just as we get legacy stuff from the ancestral environment, the function emerges from the current environment. And that goes into account for anything with the appearance of design. So it's not just things that are evolved by natural selection. These also go for things that are built. We have a design objective and it gets filtered through the components we're forced to use. It gets filtered through a manufacturing process until finally we get the mechanism that we actually get to implement. But that mechanism achieves function not by itself, but through its interaction with the current day environment. And if the current day environment changes, the function can change. And that function, um, that emergent function, um, I like to use this example, um, Space Invaders is a great example. It came out in 1978. If you're not familiar with Space Invaders, this is the game where you've got these little spaceships that you move around the bottom of the screen as invaders start dropping from the top and you fire them out of the screen. And um, it, it, and when this thing was built, it was all software timed. And so it had to draw each one of these uh, invaders as they were drawing in, each one of them manually before it could allow you to shoot. And so in 1978 on those that hardware, initially when you had lots of invaders, it was kind of a slow response. The invaders came very slowly down the screen. But once you blew them away, there were fewer invaders to draw on the screen and the redraw was actually much, much faster. And it made the game harder as you got fewer invaders on that. And people said this was actually a feature of the game that was not designed through the software. It just came out through an emergent combination of the code and that environment. And so this idea that these two things um, emerged together became really important as hardware became faster because as hardware became faster, depending on software timing, um, ended up not generating this gradient of speed as you moved from uh, the early parts of the game to the later parts of the game. As people started playing these on faster and faster hardware, they would just redraw at the same speed, regardless of if you were at the, with a lot of invaders in the screen or a short, a small number of invaders on the screen. So programmers had to go back in and modify the space invaders code to deal with the new hardware, to make things hardware timed so that regardless of what hardware platform you were using, you would get that nice effect where things were slower when there were lots of invaders on the screen and faster um, when there were fewer invaders on the screen. So that just goes to show, again, it's the combination of these two things. It's not just the code, it's the code plus its environment. And, um, and so this kind of allows me to segue to some work that I'm doing in heterogeneous um, autonomy and heterogeneous mobile vehicles with my Australian collaborators um, with these beautiful marsupials here, these quals. And this is also applies to a lot of other um, uh, of uh, the Australian fauna, like this echidna down here, kind of looks like a little porcupine. It's adorable Australian animals here. These animals, um, as these cats, domestic cats have been introduced, then you find that these domestic cats have been wreaking havoc on the native uh, wildlife there. And this has been a little bit of a puzzle to try to understand why are cats so bad um, when there are other native predators that seem kind of cat-like that have never really been this bad. And so uh, we have a set of papers out here where we've been using modeling um, to try to come to terms with uh, you know, understanding this. And so um, the, again, the basic problem here is if we have these prey species like this, and if we look at an invasive predator like this one, the top speed of this predator is similar to other native predators that were already out there. And so um, the question is here, well then, you know, so before this point, people have been using top speed as kind of an as the fundamental factor that determines whether a prey is going to be able to get away from a predator, that top speed determines pursuit evader performance. But we um, see here that that must not be the case because cats have a top speed similar to other predators and cats are doing so much better than those other predators. So what's going on here? 
And so um, our hypothesis was that heterogeneous maneuverability may play a really important role. And this heterogeneity may end up coupling in habitat features as something as important to conserve when you're trying to think about conserving these species up against these invasive predators, which may have better maneuverability than the predators that these species are usually accustomed to. So um, to kind of give you, a, you know, so, so what did we do to kind of test this idea? So we built, we started out with a very simple model where we basically said, well, what if we consider a bunch of unicycles? So unicycle dynamics down here, where we are going to give these predators, um, uh, these are prey here, like these cute little quals, they are going to have much um, a tighter turning radius, but um, maybe slower speed than um, predators. And we can give predators maybe much, much faster speeds, but much duller turning radiuses. And so basically we can study the effect of speed and turning radius as our model system for understanding the independent effects of, uh, the independent effects of speed and maneuverability. And when we do that, we can then run these, um, these animals individually, the predators and prey individually um, through different trajectories we've designed that vary in their curviness. And so um, just kind of three examples here, something that is not very curvy, something that is very curvy, something in between. And what we end up finding is that, so this is just kind of a tornado plot of, um, if we look at um, the outputs here, um, basically have to do with how fast it takes to run through a path of the same length. And what we find is that if you have very little curviness, top speed basically is the main determinant of how quickly you run through that path. But as the curviness increases, the effect of top speed drops off. And so you end up finding that path length and number of turns becomes much more important and agility starts becoming much more important. And so if we, you know, we take a, a bunch of these things together, then what we find is that if we have animals we've simulated with high amounts of agility, then we can get much faster runs even though those animals have much lower top speeds through high curviness paths than we can if we go to low curviness paths. At low curviness paths, top speed beats agility all the time, but at high curviness paths, top speed just does not help because the animals have to slow down. So this suggests that in predator-prey, uh, these pairwise interactions, that there could be a way for a slower prey to actually get an edge on a faster predator if it can force that predator to go around curvier paths if you have high habitat features. And so with that in mind, um, we built a more sophisticated computational model where we um, used a biomechanical model of limb length and body mass and some other things to force a coupling that we think is biorealistic between speed and agility. And then we ended up generating a bunch of pairwise interactions between predators and prey that could run around worlds that varied in different habitat complexities. So again, seeing how these mechanisms interact with the environment environment to provide the function. And we end up finding these beautiful plots that allow us to study a bunch of different features of the habitat. And what we end up finding, to make a long story short, is that the habitat gets more and more simple. So as you clear habitat more and more, then you find that uh, predators get an edge. And there is no way for a prey species that is slower than a predator to ever find a way to, to basically ever escape. No matter what the prey, the prey does, the predator can always take shortcuts and can always end up capturing that prey. But as you increase habitat complexity, then the only way a predator can keep up is if it has increased maneuverability itself. And so this starts explaining that as you increase domestic cats, you end up putting a better strain on the prey in their own habitats. And then as you start clearing habitat, so you know, you're cutting them down for use in agriculture, then you end up setting up even more of a situation where the prey can never get an edge. And we think this is what's happening with all all of these prey species that are going on in Australia. So understanding the effect of not just the individual animal, but the um, effect of the animal, the habitat, and then how that habitat couples them together with another animal that has a different relationship with that same habitat. It's a system together. 
So the lesson that we get from that, that I think we can apply also in thinking about, um, you know, highway systems, when we've got systems with, uh, you know, we've got cars that break, they have different stopping distances, for example, different acceleration profiles. I have seen, um, you know, uh, let's say, for example, there's uh, work out of uh, CMU on automated uh, on Chimera as a, as a tool where you can do automated proofs of um, whether you have a autonomous crash, um, sorry, autonomous collision, uh, autonomous cruise control, whether you can um, provably reject all crashes in a system that's governed by that autonomous collision, uh, autonomous cruise control. And if you assume that every vehicle is homogenous, you can get beautiful full proofs that show that you have tight following distances and you're crash free and it's safe. But the instant you start adding heterogeneity, the only way you can get proofs that you that this ACC will not uh, generate crashes is if you have giant following distances, which basically end up taking away any benefit you get of the autonomy to begin with. So you get following distances that are worse than human following distances. And so that really isn't the futuristic picture that we, we need there. So we really do need to consider heterogeneity and heterogeneity's coupling with the environment. That's kind of the kind of lesson we get from that particular study. And the kind of, you know, closing up here, kind of the lesson I'm trying to impart here with kind of high level talk is that as we get more and more increasing autonomy, we start in thinking about things like heterogeneity and all these other factors, um, then it's my claim that that there's a, a value to looking at ecology and organismal biology because these people have already thought a lot about these problems. They might use a different language, but I think they still are interested in the same things. This, of course, there are different constraints. It's not a one-to-one -one mapping, but I think we can be inspired to be thinking about problems that we aren't currently thinking about. And then as we start engaging in these conversations that are more ecology focused, then we can actually bring our quantitative perspectives back to them and actually maybe provide a different uh, lens on which to view the behaviors they are using. That's kind of what we did in this kind of Australian example with the kind of the modeling that we ended up doing that no one there was doing before um, we got involved together as an interdisciplinary team. Um, so with that in mind, I just want to give a pitch for um, something that Spring Berman will talk about, I think, tomorrow, uh, maybe just at least a little, is that um, in another collaboration we have here, which pulls in psychology, then we're starting to think about how ethics itself is something that emerges out of a, a combination of a mechanism and the physical environment, the current physical environment. It's not necessarily something that needs to be designed in explicitly. So ethical stances emerge from interaction between technology and physical environment, even if you as a designer have not said, you know, I have designed this autonomous cruise control to be ethical or not ethical. Um, regardless of what your decisions were, when that cruise control hits the ground, it will accelerate with a particular edginess that we can evaluate from an ethical perspective. So there's gonna be somebody next to that Tesla that's gonna think, wow, what jerk is driving that car? Ethics emerge naturally from the technology and the environment around them. And so rather than trying to just arbitrarily build in ethics into our vehicles, we need to think about ways that we can assess ethics in the vehicles as we have them. And through that assessment, it should provide a path for us to then better understand how we can start shaping ethics. So we need to recognize the ethics that are already there before we start building them in. And so we've sort of proposed one way to do that in a grant proposal that I'm on with Spring and, uh, and uh, Catherine and um, that uh, we just sort of put in there. And I think Spring might talk a little bit about there tomorrow, but it's just this basic idea of trying to coupling in not only the algorithms, but the physical environment and the way we view the mixture of those two together. And I think I am at about at my allocated talk time. So I will stop there and um, I'm happy to take any questions.